I'm going to be talking about nutritional support for all vegans, how to make healthy, nourishing choices for your body. <clears throat> My name is Michelle Dwyer. I'm a health coach and nutrition consultant. Um, I have a master's of science degree in health and nutrition education and I did actually my master's thesis on uh, teenagers, adolescents, and vegetarian diets because that was something I was uh, particularly interested in. I've had uh, some form of plant-based diet for about 21 years, um, sort of changed over the course of those 21 years. Um, but it's something that um, I'm very honored to be here, uh, very honored to be speaking with you today. There's a lot of information to cover. Um, and with all things nutrition, uh, the thing to keep in mind is this idea of biochemical individuality. It's the idea that uh, what is good for us might be different than what's good for someone else. So with all the suggestions that I'm offering today, um, the key is to always kind of check in with what works for you. And of course, what works for us at one point in our lives may not work for us at another point in our lives. So um, I suggest with nutrition to always be open um, to, to trying new things and um, thinking in new ways. So um, you can find me on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Pinterest, I'm on all the, the social media, or you can just go to my website. So uh, many of you probably already know some of the benefits of a vegan diet. I'm just going to go over them quickly, but um, just to kind of remind us, uh, I mean, people become and choose a vegan diet for a lot of reasons, environmental reasons, uh, of course, the, the sacredness of the animals or the treatment of the animals, factory farming, um, but there's also a lot of nutritional and um, health benefits as well. So a lower risk of death from heart disease, one of our number one killers in the United States. Lower cholesterol levels, which of course are an indicator of potential heart disease. Lower blood pressure. Lower rates of type 2 diabetes, and this is a key one. Um, you could be vegan and have type 2 diabetes if you're eating sugar all day long. So being vegan doesn't necessarily uh, lower that, but a healthy whole foods nutrition diet will. A lower body mass index. Lower all overall, overall cancer rates, and um, I'm trying to cite my sources when possible, but if you ever have any questions, please let me know. So vegan diets tend to be lower in saturated fat and cholesterol, okay, that makes sense, right, since a lot of the saturated fat and cholesterol in our diet comes from animal products have higher levels of dietary fiber. In the United States of America, we're not getting enough fiber and it's contributing to things like colon cancer, diverticulitis, and a plant-based diet, you tend to get a lot more fiber, right? Um, it's one of the wonderful, wonderful benefits. Um, most Americans are getting less than 20 grams of fiber a day and we should be getting upwards of 40 to 60 grams of fiber a day. And that should be coming from plants, not from taking some sort of supplement, right? But actually taking, getting that from food. Higher levels of magnesium, potassium, vitamin C and E, folate, uh, your carotenoids, your flavonoids, and your other phytochemicals, because guess where those come from? Those, those come from plants, those come from food, right? It's the things that make the colors of the food, the taste of the food, the smells of the food, all of those rich phytochemicals are what are contributing to our health. And the idea is most likely these nutritional differences in a plant-based diet might explain some of those health advantages that I was talking about beforehand. So I'm going to talk a little bit about deficiencies, just so that you're aware of them. I think it is very possible to have a nourishing, and that's the word I like to use, a nourishing, healthful vegan diet, but there are some deficiencies to be aware of. What does that mean? It just means that as a plant-based diet or as a vegan eater, you need to pay attention to those so that you're making sure you get those. And actually, since there's a lot of motion going on, I'm going to pass around my um, sign-in sheets. You're fine. That's up to you, whatever. I don't know if it's, yeah. I'm just passing around my sign-in sheet if anybody's interested. Um, I do a newsletter and then I, I will talk at the end about a free health history consultation if you're interested. So if you could pass that around. You, guys, if you could pass, yeah, thanks, perfect. Okay. So I'm going to talk about protein, right, because it's the first question that everybody always asks you, how are you going to get your protein? So we'll talk about the protein question. Um, essential fatty acids, 
calcium, vitamin D, iron, zinc, and vitamin B12. So those are what we're going to cover today. Does that sound like the ones that would occur to everybody? Okay, great. So the protein question, right? Where do you get your protein from? Well, you can get it from all sorts of sources. Your legumes, your beans, and your lentils are a great source. Whole grains, nuts and seeds, and their butters. Soy, um, do we want to talk about the soy issue? Yeah, okay, so, <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, so with soy, my recommendation is to stick with the fermented soys first. Right, your miso, your natto, and your tempeh. Right, fermented soy is a great way to get soy, um, and so and it's delicious. Right, it's an acquired taste. I'm a big fan of tempeh myself, but miso is great with soups. You can use it for dressings. You can use it for sauces. But the fermented soys are going to be kind of your best bet. And then kind of next on the spectrum is going to be tofu, right? Um, again, with our soy, what do we want to make sure it always is? Organic and non-GMO, right? Because soy is one of the biggest GMO um, products in our, in our country, so we want to make sure our soy is always organic, always non-GMO. Yeah, edamame, soybeans, absolutely. Again, make sure they're, they're non-GMO and organic, right? The whole bean source. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting question. Um, in my understanding, it was, right, as part of the organic uh, classification, they had to be non-GMO. And then I was just at a talk the other day, and she was saying no. And so I was like, mm, I don't think so. So um, as a little side note, right, get political here for a moment. I think I'm allowed to do that at a, a World Veg Fest. When that comes up again in terms of notification of our GMO products, make sure you get the word out, right? We have a right to know if our products are, are GMO um, and, and so, if you can get the word out, that would be great. So, what about the, the soy protein isolate? That's going to, yeah, exactly. So, that's on the other end. So, if I, we have our fermented soys over here in terms of recommendation, as long as you don't have a soy sensitivity, some people do. Um, over here is your soy, pro, soy, pro, soy protein isolate, I would avoid. And you'll see it in a lot of protein powders, you'll see it in a lot of um, nutrition bars. I would avoid it. It's a very, very processed form of soy. And, and it, it's not, it's, it, in the same way that other processed foods, it's not going to be absorbed in our body in the same nutritional way. What about the phytoestrogen? Yeah, so with the phytoestrogen, like in terms of positive and negative. Term, yeah, well, in terms of avoiding them. Yeah, so some people, it's actually very helpful to have the phytoestrogens, right? That's actually estrogen support for them. Others, it exacerbates um, a, a condition. And also men, of course, if you don't want to have too much estrogen, it's something to, to not have too much of, right? Um, so it is a spectrum, and we always want to have variety, right? Um, also with the soy protein isolate is to not have too much of the faux meats, right? Because that's not, you know, a whole food. And I'm going to talk a little bit about whole foods. And that often is soy, soy protein isolate. Yeah. Um, soy is good for you, but people tend to eat too much. Right. And what is your recommendation? Oh, in terms of how much? Um... You know, again, each person is going to be so different, but a couple times a week, every day, every meal is probably going to be too much, right, for most people, right? Um, if you were thinking about a product that you were eating every day, every meal, um, we, want, we want variety, right? Our bodies want variety, yeah. So I put kind of, um, again, if we're kind of imagining the spectrum, right, a little bit to the side of, um, of tofu, right, especially the, the stuff that you buy in the stores. It has a lot of other ingredients in it. If you made it yourself, yeah, you're definitely guaranteeing that it's just the soy. I also have over there um, a recipe for almond milk, which is very easy to make. Um, hazelnut milk is very easy to make. You can make uh, pistachio milk, which is really delicious. Cashew is great. Cashew cream. Cream is also really easy and delicious. So, yeah, I'll pass, uh, pass some of those around. Um, so yeah, again, you want to go for variety, and you don't want to overeat too much and you, of one thing, and you also want to avoid processed as much as possible. That's kind of the rule of thumb. Yeah. The fermented food is very good for you. It is. Tempeh is a fermented It Exactly. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have that every day for some reason? Um, again, because it's soy. I think tempeh is fantastic. I, I love tempeh. Um, it's fermented. They say you should have it every day. Yeah. Yeah. So again, like a variety. So have a little sauerkraut one day, have a little tempeh another day, have a little miso another day. Day, right? Get get your variety of 
True. Well, again, you can make your own, too, without the salt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So with the protein, the question is always how much do you need, right? So the RDA, right, we always want to take RDA with a, a grain of salt, but RDA is going to say 0.36 grams by your weight in pounds, okay? So for example, a 140-pound woman times 30.36 would be 50.4 grams a day. That sounds about right, okay? A uh, 170-pound man times 0.36, that's going to be 61.2 grams of protein a day. But there are sometimes some conditions where a person might need more. So children, right? Children need more protein. They're growing bodies. Protein is a big part of how we grow, how our cells grow. So children need more protein. Adolescence, another huge growth time. They need more protein. Uh, pregnant and lactating women need more protein. Athletes, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about athletes later, but any kind of strength or endurance training. If you're recovering from a disease, some diseases, other diseases you want less protein, but um, some, if you're recovering from surgery, again, protein helps us heal, so you're going to need some more protein. Some elderly people need more protein. And so for this group of people, you want to multiply, multiply your weight by 0.8 instead. So that's a big, that's a significant difference from the 0.36, okay? So that's something to think about. Okay, so the rough guidelines um, are here. So ages 1 to 3, 13 to 16 grams, and then children 4 to 8. And you can see as we get into um, adulthood, it could vary. So women 19 to 70, it could be anywhere between 46 and 50. But again, if there's a specific condition, you might need more. Uh, men ages 19 to 70, 56 to 63, and again, it's also going to depend on your weight. It's also going to depend on your lifestyle. So there's a lot of variables there. Does anybody have any questions about this piece? Yeah. Is that your total body weight or your lean uh, body mass? Total body weight. Yeah. Total body weight. Multiply by 3.36. Yeah. Also, when I don't eat enough protein, I get a cold or I get sick. Yeah. It can make you sick by not having enough protein. Yeah, so protein is part of what regenerates our cells, right? And we want to have healthy cells. It's, it actually also helps with our immune cells. So it, it could. Mm -hmm. It could be, yeah. What are the symptoms of protein deficiency? Oh, signs of... So to be really protein deficient... You, you would be, I mean, we don't, we're not in that state. But signs of where you're maybe not getting enough fatigue, maybe getting colds, um, recovery time after exercise might be a little bit slower, things like that. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So last year there was a similar presentation. Uh -huh. The recommendation was 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. For, for, for everybody? For everybody. Yeah, so this is RDA. So again, we got to have to talk a little political here. Um, RDA recommendations are kind of the baseline so that you don't get sick, right? So when you see those recommendations on labels, it's not necessarily for optimum health, it's for kind of baseline health. So if you find that you need more or that you are in a condition where you need more, then you want to up that, right? Yeah. So what about plant-based proteins, like yeah. protein not from tofu. Uh-huh. If you're getting most of your protein from veggies and kale and stuff, is that going to help with recovery and everything? Well, it's still protein, right? So here's a good example of how you might get your protein in a day. So a quality protein powder is going to be, is it too small? Is, I'll, I'll read it. So a quality protein powder is going to be between 8 and 12 grams. And that's a whole food protein powder, right? Not something that's got soy protein isolate. Um, a quarter cup of nuts, which is a serving, would we all know that? A quarter cup of nuts is a serving, not the whole bag. A quarter cup of nuts is a serving, 9 grams of protein. A cup of garbanzo beans, 12 grams. 4 ounces of tempeh, 20 grams. A half a cup of quinoa, 4 grams. And I'm thinking like throughout the day, right? I'm kind of like, and I'm not even including broccoli and kale and peas and other things. Uh, brown rice, 2.5 grams. Oh, I do have broccoli, 4 grams. And then almond butter. So this adds up to 67.5 grams of protein. Yeah, the temp is yeah, really high in protein. So you can see it's not that hard to get your 50 to 70, depending on where you are, grams of protein in a day. Yeah. Do 
worry about balancing the amino acid profiles of the different foods? Good question. So um, if you've been vegetarian or vegan for a while, do you remember when we had to complement our foods, right? We had to think about our different profiles. And we had to, you know. So the newer research is saying as long as you get the different amino acids within a day or within like if you're a healthy person within the next day, you're fine. So you don't necessarily need to combine them with foods at the moment. But you do want to think about the, the so the amino acids, the essential amino acids, right, have d different foods, have different amounts, and so we need to make sure we're getting. So like, um, tyrosine tends to be a little bit lower um, in, a, in a vegetarian diet. Um, um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Yeah. You know, I use the microwave quite a bit, and I'm wondering, I've heard different things. Uh, does the microwave really destroy the nutrients, or I don't know that I want to touch the microwave <laughs> conversation. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, again, I would say maybe limit. You know, the, we want to think about how we cook our foods. Um, some of you might be eating a mostly raw food diet. You want to make sure you have some raw food every day, even if you're not eating all raw foods, uh, because it's got the enzymes, right, that actually help us digest our food. So I would say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go a middle-of-the-road answer and say, limit your microwaving. So no, one has decided. no one has decided. Yeah, there's pretty strong feelings either way and some pretty strong evidence either way, but yeah, I would say I would say limit. I don't that's a good question. Does anybody have any microwave? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry. I know you don't like endorse any product, but for the protein powder Ah, yeah, good question. Actually, that's a great question. Um, and thank you, actually, for bringing up the endorsing. I'm going to recommend two products today just because there's some that I've used with clients. Otherwise, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you've got to find a product that works for you. There's a lot of great products out there. For the protein powder, um, again, I like to go with more whole and natural. Um, so I use hemp as my protein powder. Um, that it's, it's just ground hemp seeds, and it's a fantastic form of protein. I digest it well. I do well with it. And it's, it's clean, right? It's just ground hemp seeds. So, um, and you're not going to test positive on drug testing. No. Um, I think hemp seeds are fantastic, and I like that, um, you know, that you can, and again, that's non-genetically modified, that's organic, and, and it's just really basic. It doesn't have a lot of added other things. Um, it's it's there's a bunch of different products that you can get. She is great. She is I add chia to my my protein shakes every day. Yeah. So chia, you get your some omega threes, you get some protein, and you get some fire fiber. So chia seeds are great to add. The bars. Check. I'm just gonna say with the bars. Check your labels. Um, there are ton of sugar in them, even if it's not. Um, you know, even if it's organic cane sugar, they're very, very high in sugar. Um, there's a lot of great recipes out there to make your own bars. And um, I suggest, again, like less ingredients are better. So like Lara bars, are, are the sugar comes from the dates. They're still really high in sugar, but at least it's coming from a whole food. Um, and almonds or whatever, yeah. Hemp, I know that um, hemp power. How much, how, yeah. how much do you need on that? It doesn't say there for the... Uh, yeah, so for the protein powder, I kind of left it open depending on what kind you might use. Um, but with the hemp, it's three to four tablespoons. Mm -hmm. And I will give this caveat, <laughs> it's a little gritty, right, because it's just ground hemp. So if you're looking for a really smooth, you know, protein powder that you can put in your shaker, hemp's not the one. It's pretty gritty, um, but I prefer, you know, I'll, I'll take a little grit for, for the quality of it. Um, I've used Vega One as well. Has anybody ever used Vega One? Um, protein powders. Yeah, I, I think those are good. I think it's got a good nutrition profile. Um, it's a little sweet to me. They put stevia in it, and I wish they didn't, but yeah. I was going to, two quick questions. Yeah. It says cooked broccoli. So yeah. Is there a difference between cooked broccoli and regular Yeah, broccoli? so there's a little bit, um, when you cook foods, some of them, it incre like cooked spinach actually increases the nutrition profile versus raw spinach, but some it decreases. So I don't remember what raw broccoli is, but. but um, it would be different. Yeah, it's a little bit different, not much. And then um, quickly, is any of this on your website, this presentation? Um, no, but <laughs> um, I have some blogs about some pieces, and um, I think they're probably all gone, but there were some um, green sheets that go, were going around that had a lot of this, so yeah. And um, what I can do, too, if you sign up 
on the, the sign-up sheet, wherever it is. Um, I'll send out the email of this. Actually, I'll hand this to you. I'll send out this, what actually has all the notes, right? So I'll send that out to everybody. Okay, yeah. Are all notes created equal? No, not all notes are created equal, and not necessarily in a bad way, right? So again, with variety, right? Um, so I recommend getting quite a few different nuts and mixing it up. So one day doing pumpkin seeds, another day doing sesame seeds, another day doing almonds, another day doing cashews, because each one's going to have a different nutrition profile. And so again, going with the, the variety, right? So I, you know, I mean, I get usually like four different types of nuts at a time, and then just kind of rotate through them. Because it can be really easy. I don't know. Does anybody love almonds? Yeah. Right? Right? Heck yeah. And it can be really easy to just, just eat almonds and just eat almond butter. So it's nice to get that variety. Get some tahini so that you're mixing some sesame seed. It makes a great dressing. It makes a great sauce. Um, get some almond butter, but also get some cashew butter and make some cashew cream. Like, again, going for the variety. Is tahini, do you consider it too fatty? So we're going to talk about the fat a little bit. Um, actually, is our next one? We'll talk about that with the essential fatty acids. So going back to the biochemical individuality piece, what a person's fat needs are going to depend on a lot of different things. So some people need a lot of fat. Um, and, and I think... Again, I don't want to make a blanket statement, but I think sometimes a vegan diet can be a little deficient in, in healthy fats. And so healthy fats coming from plant sources, coming from nuts, coming from seeds, coming from avocados. Any avocado fans out there? Um, right? That can, is, is a healthy part of our diet. So, uh, But again, if someone is having serious heart disease and they need to lose a lot of weight, then maybe they want to restrict their fat for a while so that... Um, they can kind of get their body back in balance. But if you're, if you're, if you're a healthy person at a healthy weight, um, and fats actually can be a very helpful part of, of weight loss, of healthy weight loss, too. So, And you're not, you know, with tahini, have we all had tahini? Have you had tahini? You're not going to eat, like, <laughs> it's very strong, right? So, like, you're not going to eat a lot of tahini at a time. So I think, I think you're going to be okay. Yeah. You make your own hummus. Oh. So good, right? Um, I use I use tahini all the time for um, dressings to make dressings creamy. Um, hummus actually makes dressings really creamy too. I love that. Yeah. Um, and your last time, how would uh, tofu have been in your chart? Oh, in terms of the scale, tofu I kind of put in the middle, right? In terms of grams it, of oh, grams of protein. It's a little similar to. It's less than um, tempeh. less than tempeh. Yeah, yeah. And it's not complete protein, right? Tempeh, it? uh, that's a good question. I don't think... Yeah, it's all soy. It's fermented, which would change the protein. So I mean, the... If, if um, it's a complete protein. I don't think tempeh is going to be a complete... Maybe with the fermentation. Yeah. Um, they said that flaxseed oil gets rancid really easily. It does. Yeah. Worry about that? What should I do? Yeah, so flaxseed, never ever cook with it. Keep it in the refrigerator, and you should always buy it in a bottle that's dark. Right. Okay? So that's really, really important. So flaxseed is not a cooking oil. And um, very briefly on rancid, um, getting quite the education today. So rancid, uh, we, want our, we don't want our fats to go rancid, because when they go rancid and they get on our body, they cause havoc. Right? They cause... Um, uh, oxidation. And so we don't want to have rancid um, foods. And we always thought, oh, rancid. But if you cook something, an oil that is, so each of our oils are kind of um, organized dif differently in their chemistry. If you cook with flaxseed, it goes rancid and then it gets in your body and causes problems. Um, cooking some oils at too high of a heat can cause the same situation. So for sauteing, for, um, for a vegan diet, I recommend coconut oil, right? Because it can handle the higher heat profile. And don't too, too, do, do too high of a heat. Do like a medium heat. Um, olive oil you can also cook with, but I would keep that at a lower, a lower heat. Yeah. I was just going to say coconut oil. You haven't got that okay. Yeah, um, because it's not a, for an essential fatty acid, but it is a healthy fat. Oh. Yeah. So this is our EFAs. Our, our, yeah. You, you got this thing for almond milk. Yeah. I buy the almond crunch, and it's expensive. You know, can, can you? Can What's you almond just, crunch? Well, it's it's no water in there. It's just eat it. I don't know. Oh. But I, I, 
just thing almonds. there. Just almonds. Yeah, yeah. Just almonds. Okay. Like crunchy. Yeah. You don't make that. I don't. <laughs> I don't make almond crunch. It's just the ground almonds. It's just the, yeah. It's just the ground almonds. Okay. Not yeah. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really suggest. Um, with the milks, right, yeah. to expand. Hazelnut milk is awesome, and you don't actually have to soak the hazelnuts. Um, with the almonds, you do want to soak them. Cashew uh, cream is really delicious. So there's a lot of things you can do on your own. Yeah. What's the reason for having to soak the almonds? I was told that years ago, and I still don't know why. Yeah, so you're softening them, right, and you're releasing the, the milk, too. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about soaking later in terms of that's a different thing, yeah. What are your ideas about um, like baking with flax as like an egg replacement? Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great idea. So there's, if you go online and it'll tell you like one egg equals this much flax, soak it first, right? Let it get gelatinous. So if you're using the whole seed, you don't have the same concerns with the rice. Ah, good question. So flax seed as well, right? Once you ground flax seed, it starts to deteriorate. So what the best thing to do is to buy your flax seed whole, Keep it in the refrigerator, keep it sealed, keep the oxygen out, and ground as needed. That's a good question. Um, usually with the baking and everything, it should, it should be fine, but that is a good question. Yeah. Yeah. How long will they last? Oh, cold pressed oils in the refrigerator. Um, such as flaxseed oil. Yeah, so use it. If you look at the recommendation on a flaxseed, it'll say use within the, the few months. So, yeah, yeah, you definitely want to use those sooner rather than later because they will start to deteriorate. Those are great um, questions. Someone yeah. told me not to use flaxseeds every day. What do you recommend? Chia seeds are nice too. No, no, I'm saying how. What do you recommend oh, how for often? Flax seeds? Hmm. How many tablespoons Did, for flaxseeds? I mean, I switch up my flax seeds and my chia seeds again to do the variety. So one day I'll do flax seeds, another day I'll do chia but seeds. Is it bad to do flax seeds every day? I've heard. For the, again, with the estrogens. estrogens. It can Yeah. Again, like depending on your nutrition needs. I mean, it's the challenge of doing a nutritional talk is that everybody's needs are so different, really, and that's actually a challenge with our society, right? When these, these uh, studies come out and say, eat this, don't eat this, right? Um, what one person should eat is going to be very different than what another person should eat. What one person needs right now is going to be very different than what they're going to need in five or ten years. So these are all guidelines, suggestions, but you have to kind of, you know, the challenge and the excitement is figuring out what works, what works for you. Yeah. recommend I'm not I'm not there's a, there's a lot of good quality ones I'll let that one be kind of there's a lot of good good brands but again you want to go for quality right don't don't get a cheap one and one of the ways is that it's in a dark bottle right make sure it's it's packaged well um, so other four places you can get essential fatty acids are walnuts or walnut oil um, soy has some again the chia seeds pumpkin seeds also have some um, if Bragg's the brand or the, uh, the, the amino, amino acids? Brand, brand amino acids. The liquid amino acids are great. Okay. I would get that in terms of, um, I use that instead of soy sauce, right? Because there's a lot less so sodium. You get this nice um, amino acid profile. Is that fatty acids? No, no, those are amino acids. I know, it's so confusing, awesome. right? <laughs> Um, so some people might want to consider supplementing for their essential fatty acids and the best vegan source, and this is to get your full amount of your EPA and DHA, and for vegans, um, it's going to come from algae. So, um, you know, this is, this is what you would take if you didn't want to take fish oil. Um, and, and I, this is one of the ones where I'm going to recommend a brand. There are other brands that have algae oil, um, but Nordic Naturals is just a, a, has a good reputation for having quality products. They do a lot of great testing. Um, and so it's not the only place where you can get algae omega oil, but it is one place that I would, I would suggest and recommend. Can you get your, oh, <clears throat> Okay. All right, calcium. So... 
We all know it's a myth that you have to get it from dairy, right? Okay, so we have to educate the world, right? And you probably have to educate your loved ones because probably after the protein question, the next question you might get, but how are you going to get your calcium without drinking your glass of milk a day? Well, really, no adult should be drinking a glass of milk a day, right? Vegan, not vegan, grass-fed, cow willingly gave it over, I don't care, right? It's not food for adult humans, right? It just isn't. It's not, it's not, yeah, maybe it is delicious in coffee, right? But we can have other things. Almond milk. Almond milk. I use coconut milk in my coffee. It's a little decadent, but I love it because it actually is much creamier than the almond milk. The almond milk, you put it in your coffee and it doesn't do much. Right? Um, it doesn't do much. So I, I, I put, I, I put uh, coconut milk in my, but you can get your calcium from your dark leafy greens, which of course we want to be getting. And I put the absorption levels here. Um, so with dark leafy greens, you're actually absorbing 50 to 60% of the calcium that's in the dark leafy greens. Calcium set tofu is about 30 to 35. Um, I took out the dairy, obviously, because we're talking about vegan. Um, originally, this was part of a vegetarian conversation. The, um, the, the dairy absorption is around the tofu absorption. It's not, it's not 100%, um, despite what the dairy board might want us to think. Sesame seeds, almonds, and dried beans um, are also a, a source of calcium. So again, you're getting it from a variety of places. And I really want you to think about that with all of your foods. You're not trying to get all your protein with one food, right? You're not trying to get all your calcium with one food. You're getting it from a variety of different places that are also giving you so many other great nutrients. Other sources, your fortified foods, right? So sometimes they add calcium to things, figs, blackstrap molasses, um, and then some of your other nuts. And how much do you really need? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, not necessarily, not necessarily. No, I think you can get, I think you can get it from food. Um, again, it depends on if you're male or female and what age you are. Generally around 1,000 milligrams, but it's gonna, it's gonna depend, so yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, for convenience, canned beans are very convenient. But uh, if you actually use the whole bean, dried bean, it actually does have a little bit higher nutrition profile. Does that lentils? Yeah. 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 What, what about kefir for the digestion as well? So, like a coconut kefir? Just a regular kefir. So regular kefir isn't isn't it's vegan, right? Regular kefir is 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 from milk, right? Yeah, um, but they do mm -hmm, absolutely. Probiotics are super important. So I don't know if there's any toxins we can on fermented foods, but if there is, go to it. Um, really, it's one of the best things you can do for your health. Getting those healthy probiotics, it keeps our guts healthy. That supports our immune system. That supports our mood, right? There's a lot of research coming out about gut health and our mood, right? Depression, anxiety, um, coming from our bacteria in our gut, right? And so our fermented foods are a great way. And guess what? Many of our fermented foods, right? We might think, oh, kefir or yogurt. But all of our fermented vegetables, right? Eating of fermented vegetables is a great way to get those probiotics. Um, you can actually get coconut kefir. So there are non-dairy kefirs, kombucha. Oh, kombucha. Anybody kombucha? If you haven't tried kombucha, it's weird the first time you drink it, right? It, you're like, why am I drinking this? This is vinegar, but it is, it, it, it's an acquired taste, and then, yeah. Um, make sure you get the kind without added sugar, though. That's my, my recommendation, because some of the kombuchas have a lot of sugar, so just make sure. It's actually made from fermenting the sugar, and the sugar gets taken out, so just check the label to make sure they didn't add some sugar back in. Sauerkraut is a fermented food, and they make a lot of really great raw sauerkraut, so if you can get your hands on some of that. And with the fermented foods, you don't need a lot. So you don't have to have a whole plate of sauerkraut to get your probiotics. If you look at traditional cultures, they all have a little bit of fermented food on their plate. So think about like pickled ginger at a sushi restaurant, or a little bit of kimchi in Korean food, right? That little, the sauerkraut from European, right? That little bit of 
um, fermented foods. Our, our ancestors probably didn't know anything about probiotics. They knew about how to, to save their food, right, because they didn't have refrigeration and ferment, fermentation was a way to do it. But guess what? It was actually super healthy for them. And we have kind of moved away from that, right? Um, and so I think that's a has nothing to do with really with calcium, but is actually a really important thing is to talk about the probiotics. Right, exactly. So vitamin D, Where's, where do we get our vitamin D from? The sun. the sun, that's right. So from sunlight. So there are very few sources, food sources, no vegan food sources, so sometimes supplementation is recommended. Um, if you're inside a lot, if you live in a higher climate during the winter. If you're having some immune deficiency, sometimes vitamin D can be helpful skin, for that. Skin, skin. Yeah, yeah, dark skin people, right? Are, are, you have different melanin levels. So um, as we get older, we may not actually be converting. Vitamin D is actually not a vitamin, it's a hormone. And our bodies have to convert it from the sun with our skin. And our skin changes as we get older, alas. And so, um, so sometimes there might be supplementation necessary. A lot of people don't realize that when the winter sun goes down, we don't get enough sunlight to actually synthesize vitamin D. And right. San Francisco, basically from the beginning of November until the middle of February, we cannot get enough vitamin D production from the sun. And yeah. The yeah. And, you know, I mean, most of us are inside a lot, and when we are outside, we're putting on sunscreen. So, yeah. The latest thing is that's the most important thing for your health. Is having enough vitamin D in your system mm -hmm. for everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what do you recommend? In so with vitamin D, the, the, my suggestion is get tested. If you feel like you might be vitamin D deficient, there's a there's a test that you can get, and yeah, it'll okay. test your blood level, serum level, and that's a great place to go. With regard to supplementation, and I'll I'll get to your question. Um, so D2 is usually vegan. And D3 is usually sourced from lanolin, from sheep. So, and you want D3. There's, there's a lot of research that's saying D3 might be a better source than D2. So what do you do if you... So with the lanolin, and I'm not a sheep shearer, so if someone knows more about this, but my understanding is, you know, the, the, the animal is not being killed for the lanolin, but the sheep shearing process, if you don't want to be a part of, you know, animal husbandry at all, then you got to look out for a different D3. So I have found one D3 that, and this is one. This is the only other specific recommendation I'm giving. Um, it's a VitaShine product, which was coming out of Europe. It's actually made from lichen. Little things on the rocks and trees, right? Um, and VitaShine. Um, Vibrant Nutraceuticals is actually a distributor for VitaShine here in the United States. So if you are concerned about D3 and you want a vegan source of it, that this is the only one that I have found so far. If someone knows of others, please um, let me know because this is ongoing research. But um, you can take the D2. There is some re research saying that the D3 is better absorbed into our bodies. So. Let me, let me answer his and then I'll come back. Yeah. In your previous slide, I don't understand one point that uh -huh. says there's no vegan source of vitamin D. Uh huh, right. Oh. Yeah, so you can't get vitamin D from food. You can or You cannot. cannot. You cannot get vitamin How D from food. The Costco and Safeway, they now sell the mushroom with vitamin D2. Oh, interesting. Um, a mushroom with vitamin D2. Yeah, that's not D2, you don't want it. Yeah, and, and I don't know how much of that mushroom you'd have to eat to oh, get. <laughs> really? <laughs> Try it. Let me know how it goes. I don't know. I haven't heard of this mushroom. But, I mean, and is it like a specially made mushroom, or is it just an or naturally uh, okay. high? This mushroom is sold in Costco. Uh. Safeway sells their own brand of mushroom. Uh. It has vitamin D. I'm a little, I'm, I, I'm not saying it's not true, I'm just a little, I'm a little leery of it. Yeah. Same question, I was, you, so, I've heard that oh. are very high in vitamin D and I didn't have enough for that. Oh, hi. That is true. Okay. 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 Mm-hmm. But it's a dried mushroom then? Yes. And then you reconstitute it or you eat it dry? You it up into a powder. 
Okay. Oh, so more like a, as a supplement? Is that what you're saying? Okay, rather than just eating the mushroom. Okay. Yeah. Um, so to get the vitamin D, you, need to, you literally need to go outside without the sunblock. Mm -hmm. But not for long. 15 yeah, 15 minutes. minutes. Exactly, 15, 20 minutes a day. And again, it's going to depend on a lot of other things going on in your body, but that's kind of the general rule of thumb. What's that? You can't do it in the winter. Right, and in the winter, at our, at our latitude, right, it's just not going to be enough. Okay, iron. So this might be another one that you hear a lot about of, as a vegetarian or as a vegan, like, oh, you're going to get your iron. So again, our green leafy vegetables, brewer's yeast, again, the dried beans, uh, blackstrap molasses. So you're hearing some things come up a lot, right? So um, stock your pantry with these foods. Dried fruits like apricots and raisins, almonds, mangoes. Um, some soy products are fortified with iron. Um, some cereals are fortified, and um, some of our grains are enriched. Now, I'm not, I don't actually, cereals are pretty processed foods, um, and most of the nutrition coming from cereals has been added back in. It's not actually coming from the food, so um, just a caveat on that. Yeah? I heard that you could develop a, a nut allergy later in life, like for, since you're exposing yourself to almonds, like daily or frequently, is that actually possible? So it is possible. If you eat any food all the time, it, it's possible to develop a sensitivity to it, which is, again, why I like the variety. So eat almonds one day, eat walnuts another day, have some cashews, do some mixed nuts. But really, I think variety is a good way um, to do that. Yeah. With the dried fruits, there's concern about the sulfur. Sulfur. Yeah, so you can get sulfur free. Um, they don't look as pretty if you've ever seen unsulfured dried fruits. Have you seen them before? Right. So instead of the bright orange apricots, they're dark. Right? They're dark brown. And you're like, why would I eat that? But I, I, I get um, unsulfured um, prunes. And so, um, yeah, I, I suggest getting, especially if you are sulfur, if you're allergic to sulfites, which a lot of us are, are sensitive to sulfites. Um, and then also with all your dried fruits, because I just did a sugar talk, make sure they're not sweetened. Um, because many dried fruits they'll add. Yeah, it's sweet enough. Um, cranberries are kind of notorious. They're always sweetened. Um, but you can get some cranberries that are fruit juice sweetened, so at least it's a little bit better. What about fresh fruit? Yeah, what about it? Oh, for the iron, um, yeah, mangoes is probably the, your higher source. It doesn't mean that there isn't any iron, but I was kind of aiming for the ones that are kind of your better sources of, of iron. But yeah, definitely, you should eat fresh uh, fruit. Mangoes high in sugar? I've been eating mangoes, and I think they're too high in sugar. What do you think? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, so with, with the fruits, right, you, there's kind of higher glycemic yeah. fruits and lower glycemic. So bananas tend to be higher in sugar. Mangoes tend to be a little higher in sugar. Berries, very low in sugar. So great way to start your day is with some berries. Yeah. You want to start your day with, low, low, with a steady blood sugar, so putting some berries in your... Um, smoothie or in your oatmeal or whatever you're doing, low, like, low, yeah, banana. I don't know. When I have my banana in the morning, I'm very hungry very quickly, right? So if you love your bananas, save them for the afternoon is my suggestion. Uh, a whole mango every day. Yeah. But if that's your only, like, sugar that you're getting for the day and you're getting the rich fiber and you're getting all the vitamins, you, you, you would probably be fine, yeah. Yeah. Aside from an allergy, is there anything harmful about sulfur per se? Did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, um, not necessarily, right? I mean, it's just, it's a preservative, and so it's part of it. And it's in wine, you know, it's in a lot of things. Um, but it causes a lot of people either headaches or wheezing or migraines, and you might not even realize you have a sulfite sensitivity, so... About wine, yeah, it's in it's in a lot. You can get sulfite free wine, but it's 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 challenging. And you can also get vegan wine. So yeah, wine itself is an issue, doesn't isn't it? Doesn't it like destroy your vitamins and? Well, alcohol. You guys are bringing all the good stuff up. I love it. Um, I sh I I should have just done Q and A. I think that one has just been like. Um, you know, with alcohol, again, it's a very, yeah, it's a very individual choice. I mean, for some of us, having a glass of wine a day, red wine, especially Pinot Noir, high in reversitrol, um, it, it can be great.
can be great. And for others of us, right, it can actually cause a lot of havoc in our gut. It does kill our healthy bacteria. It is also a fermented food, so yeah. And there might be some, you know, links to, to you know, preventing heart disease, but then there's pesticides. So that is a good point. Get organic wines. Get vegan wines when you can. Um, and with all things, in moderation, and what in moderation means for you might be very different for someone else. In moderation might mean no wise. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so balsamic vinegar would count in that fermented pack. It is. It is. All your vinegars are fermented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I suggest, in terms of if you wanted it for a probiotic uh, effect, going with the unfiltered uh, apple cider vinegar, mm -hmm. raw apple cider vinegar. And if you um, having are having digestive issues, or you, um, is anybody like not hungry in the morning like you wake up and you're not hungry this can be a nice thing um, putting a little apple cider vinegar in some warm water and drinking that before um, you start as you start the day can sort of wake up the digestive system um, having a little bit of apple cider vinegar with your meals is also very helpful you get a little bit of the probiotics and it works as a digestive so again our, our ancestors knew this right they used to drink digestives or they would drink their bitters right um, the bitter herbs because it helps with digestion, so. How much apple cider vinegar would you use on the table? One to two, ta one to two ta teaspoons would be fine. You could, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you could work up to a tablespoon if you wanted. Yeah. For breast cancer, yeah. Mm -hmm. There have been some, so for, for wine, for alcohol, yeah, limiting it to no more than, than a glass a day. Mm -hmm. And definitely, I mean, there are definitely studies that show no alcohol in terms of breast cancer prevention is the best, is the best route, so. Yeah. It is sugar too, no, absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You want to be in the preventive side, the safe side. Yep. No, no. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. It is a form of sugar, yeah. Because there's so many people here, when people ask a question, can you repeat the question? Repeat the question, absolutely. Yes, absolutely, I know, I know. Thank you all for coming. Okay, oh, um, so iron, a little bit more about iron. So um, there's hemi and non-hemi iron. The non-hemi iron is the kind that you would be eating in a vegetarian or vegan diet. So it is recommended that you increase it to 1.8 times the recommendation, okay? So you want to get a little bit more of your iron. And take any of your iron-rich foods with vitamin C. So have it with an orange, have it with your mango, have it with a, a, a yam or sweet potato. So broccoli, really high in vitamin C. You want to pair your iron-rich foods with vitamin C so that you get greater absorption. Okay? Question. Yeah. What is the daily recommended milligrams for calcium and iron? You know what? I don't have that off the top of my head, but I could get that for you. It's not yeah. good for the men, though. Yeah. Without iron. Uh, without iron. Uh huh. And and men's <laughs> needs are different than women's needs, and women's needs change because of their menstrual cycle as well. So again, that kind of biochemical individuality. So zinc. This is something that can be low for men. Um, men who are interested in creating offspring, you might want to think about uh, supplementing your zinc. It's very important for uh, fertility. So. Um, but lentils, again, your lentils and your beans, pumpkin seeds are a great source of zinc, sesame seeds. Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts. We need to, like, I don't know, start a Brazil nut party because there's, there's, there's re it's a really great nutrition profile, and I don't think we often think about Brazil nuts. So um, I wonder if we should open that door. It is a little warm in here. Uh, sunflower seeds, your fermented soy, and cocoa. Cocoa. So, so getting a good quality cocoa. All righty. B12. Um, so, is only found in eggs and dairy and animal products. I do not recommend, and again, there might be other people who have a different opinion, but my suggestion is going to be to not get your B12 from fermented foods, blue-green algae, or sea vegetables. The research is showing it's a different form of B12 and is absorbed differently in the body. So this is, if there's one thing that you have to supplement, it's your B12. Okay? So that's really, really important. Now, if you're new to a plant-based diet, it may take quite a few years before your B12 is depleted. So you may not notice anything, and then seven years into a vegetarian or vegan diet, you might be like, hey, 
The other group of people, and you should spread the word, vegan or not, plant-based or not, as we get older, we stop absorbing B12 the same way. Does anybody know how and why? Anybody know? So B12 we need um, intrinsic factor, right, in our stomachs. And the way that the intrinsic factor is released is through hydrochloric acid, right? Hydrochloric acid, our stomach is very acidic. The hydrochloric acid connects to the intrinsic, acid, uh, the intrinsic factor and that's how we absorb our B12. As we get older, we make less hydrochloric acid in our stomachs. And so less absorption of B12. Now we also, I'm gonna call it an epidemic. We have an epidemic of treating things like acid reflux with medicines that, not, that lower our acid even more. And we're causing even more problems in terms of our digestion, in terms of our absorption. So um, all those like Prilosex and all those kind of things, right? is actually for many people not what they should be taking. And if they are taking it, they definitely, regardless of their diet, should take a B12 supplement because they're, they're not absorbing. Yeah. It's the same question. Great. <laughs> I was going to ask, um, I was told that vitamin C and B12 don't go together. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you mean like to take it at the same time? Yeah, like you have to take it at different parts of the day. Do you know anything about that? I, I have not. I'm trying to think. I'm thinking, yeah. Well, off of that, like, if you were to take a B12 while eating an orange, do you think that would have a big impact? Um, I know the iron you need it for the absorption with your B12. I'm trying to think, Does anybody, has anybody else heard that? To not take your C? No, I think it has no B in the Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely some you want to take, like, you want to take your, if you're going to take a supplement of magnesium and calcium and vitamin D, for example, you want to take that together. But I'll look into that. I've not heard the C with the B12. The other group of people who often need a B12 supplement, very importantly, is anyone with celiacs um, because it changes the, the gut. Yeah. Oh, what about brewer juice? For yeah, so um, brewer yeast or uh, nutritional yeast, nutritional yeast, um, brewer yeast has it more naturally, nutritional yeast adds the bees in. Um, it's a fortified product, so, or the, the, the so nutritional it's yeast. Um, it's fine, but I would also still take a supplement. Yeah. Well, I take a sublingual uh -huh. supplement. Yeah. That way the, the digestive system doesn't have to exactly. worry. Exactly. So that. sublingual, taking your vitamin B sublingual so that you're not worrying about the digestion the piece. <laughs> yeah, I'm just repeating because I know other people may yeah, not okay. hear. Do you know of a holistic alternative to Prilosec? Yes. What was that? An alternative to Prilosec. So, um... So usually people who are on those kind of things is because of some sort of acid reflux, right? So there's a couple of things that you can do. So first things is eat less food at a time, right? So that you're putting less pressure on your stomach. Um, often it's not a case of too much acid, it's acid in the wrong place. So as we get older or if we eat certain foods that irritate the connection between our esophagus and our stomach, that's supposed to open and close very precisely. Closes so that none of the acid goes back up. If that is no longer working and it gets kind of open, then the acid starts to push back up. That's for many people. So eating less foods and eating um, at a time and eating smaller meals throughout the day can be very helpful. Um, not eating too late at night, right? Because some people, their acid reflux really gets worse at night, right? When they're laying down. So um, that can be something. And then actually increasing or helping support the acid in your body so having a little bit of apple cider vinegar or having like a little bit of Swedish um, bitters to again kind of ignite the, 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 your stomach to make more acid um, and for some people digestive enzymes work well or the fermented foods. Swedish, Swedish bitters. Has anybody ever used? So um, any cocktail drinkers out there you might see bitters in drinks, right? But Swedish bitters, um, and you can make your own as well, um, but it's basically different herbs that are very tonic. They, um, they're tonic to the liver, so they're good liver support, um, but also in our stomach they help increase the, um, the, the acid and help us break down and digest our food. So if you have trouble digesting, um, Swedish bitters, and again, it's sort of like the apple cider vinegar. You put just a teaspoon in some water, it tastes very bitter, <laughs> um, but it can be a nice digestive that way. Uh, I've been told not to use the cyanide. 
cyanocobalamin, mm -hmm. the methylcobalamin. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Because yeah. most of it that's being sold is cyanocobalamin. Yeah, so again, this is the kind of form of B12. So. With vitamins, right, um, I'll kind of make this like short, but all forms of vitamins are not necessarily equal, right? And so um, as more research is being done, it's the different kinds of um, B12 that is more, and the methyl is the one that you want to go for, not the cyano, so. Good, yeah. And can you take it not they do sometimes, you're right, that's a really good point. Yes, you can, depending on your digestion. So um, if, you, uh, if you can take it uh, not sublingually. Here's the other thing, too. Um, as you get older, one, um, one of the signs of B12 deficiency looks like dementia. Yeah. Confusion, memory loss difficulty with names. So if you have an older person in your life that feels like suddenly um, there might be some dementia, uh, again, I'm not a doctor, but try some B12 and you'll know if it's working because you'll see differences, right? And again, getting a quality B12 in there, I would definitely recommend the sublingual because often it's because of an acid issue. Yeah. And if you don't get enough B12, you can actually damage your spine. Yeah. Nerve, that. nerve damage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there a test for deficiency? Yes. B12 is another great one that you can get a test for. And if you're severely deficient, you can actually get a B12 shot. So, for example, people with celiacs often will get a B12 shot, bypassing the whole sublingual, bypassing everything, right? <laughs> just, just put it right in. B12 is actually one of the first... Uh, vitamins that they actually created as a shot and was they kind of would just give it out pretty pretty freely um, and now they're kind of reining that in a little bit. I mean, where do you get blood tested? A blood test with your doctor. Yeah, you could, mm -hmm. your regular doctor will do it. Yeah. So we've got to be advocates for our health, right? You can get your vitamin D tested, you can get your B12 tested. Okay, how many grams should one take? Again, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to vary, so. So how would you know it's dosage? Yeah. So you'll know. Yeah. And with those ranges, I also recommend looking at the optimum range. With all those blood tests, that you, I mean, you've all had a blood test done, right? And the range is whatever it is. It'll be like from 3 to 300. And you're like, okay, I'm 150. What does that actually mean? So looking at um, kind of different ranges of tests of what's more, actually more optimal. Yeah. What are the early signs of vitamin B12 deficiency? So those things like fatigue, right? Fatigue is a sign of B12 deficiency. Um, brain confusion or just kind of memory memory issues sometimes it's a nerve issue right so neck or nerve issue yeah what was that? I, I think that's sort of in that second bullet point it, it I'm just gonna say as my recommendation there are other people who believe differently but as my recommendation not getting it from food getting it from a supplement no. Because it's a different form of B12 that's absorbed yeah, into our life body. Extension, mm -hmm. Life extension out of Florida is the best place to get any test done. You okay. Need a doctor. You can just do it directly. And once you get the test done, you talk to the people and they explain in detail what the test shows and what you should take for it. Great. Life extension. life extension. You can do lab tests. Yeah. 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 You don't need a doctor. You need a any blood test? Yeah, and many um, like naturopathic doctors will do blood tests as well, and they'll actually look at your um, blood levels and actually do more of the optimum um, focus rather than a traditional allopathic doctor. So I want to say this is actually very important because most doctors that don't routinely deal with vegans or vegetarians yes. will completely miss it. Yeah, no, you're right. I'm a, I've been a long-term vegetarian yeah. I know the stuff, but I had a surgery and I wasn't able to eat salt food for mm -hmm. two days. Mm -hmm. And while I was in recovery, I began developing the symptoms. I went to my doctor. I was, in fact, too fatigued to think it through. Of course, right. You no, know, but once the doctor he said, it's this, it's that, it's the other thing. And after about three weeks, I began thinking about it, supplementing myself, and I became you were, better. And it was a B12 deficiency. Right. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if it's going to be in your slides. You also might consider iodine deficiency. Yeah, I didn't talk about iodine deficiency, but it is something to consider. 
Yeah. That's important. And iodine salt. Do yeah. That. Yeah. So um, with the iodine, so the iodine is tricky because if you have any thyroid issues, you have to be really careful with your iodine. Um, I recommend getting it from food sources, sea vegetables, kelp. Yeah, your kelps and seaweeds. Is 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 you should get it? You know, in that natural form. Yeah. Yes, I love nutritional yeast. Everybody love nutritional yeast? We all know about it, right? It's on my table. Yep. So the B12 in nutritional yeast is fortified. That's not a bad thing, but it's delicious. In fact, actually, for those of you who got my um, almond milk recipe, is, is, I don't know if there's any of those still around, but look on the other side. There's, uh, and I'll send this out too. If you get, if you get signed up on the sign-in sheet, and if you didn't, you, I'll, I'll be out at the table. You can come talk to me there. But on the back side is a vegan spinach artichoke dip. So good. Okay, so um, I served this at a party that had, I mean, I'm not even going to call them omnivores. It had carnivores. And they loved my vegan spinach artichoke dip. So, um, but in that is nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is a great way to make things cheesy, right, to have that cheesy flavor. So if you want to make mac and cheese, vegan, um, this is really great. So it, it's, it's part of that. But yeah, you can definitely sprinkle some nutritional yeast on your, I, I usually do it on my lunch for some reason. It's on my table. And you can definitely get it that way too. That B12. Um, it's actually a lot of your B vitamins. It's got B6, it's got B12, it's got, mm, I think some B2 and B3 as well. Mm -hmm. And alcohol destroys your bees. It does. Alcohol and sugar. Quick thing on bees. Alcohol and sugar, right, are really detrimental to bees. And uh, most of your bees, not B12, but your other bees, you need every day, right? So, um, and sugar actually depletes our bodies of it. All right, so I... I'm going to be mindful of the time. It is 11:30, so we've got some time. I don't, I don't know where they went, but I'll send it out on the email. Yeah. Does anybody, does anybody see a stack of any of the gold sheets, or did they all get taken? Some of you got. Oh, here's a few more. Here we go. Thank you. Anybody else? And I'll send it. I'll send it out. So if you get on the email list. Okay. So this is going to be pretty short because this is going to be a topic all in itself. Um, but first of all, to be inspired by our vegan athletes, um, Josh Garrett, the most, oh, I put too many T's there. Josh Garrett! Um, <laughs> does anybody know what Josh recently just did? Anybody know about Josh? He did the Pacific Crest Trail. He broke the record and he did it on a completely plant-based fuel. Um, and, and I think the Mercy for Animals people are actually here. I, saw, I think I saw them. So, um, yeah, so a lot of these are endurance athletes, triathletes. Um, yeah, Carl Lewis, plant-based, vegan, right? Pretty amazing. Um, and there's boxers and there's weightlifters and there's body, you know, there's all sorts of people. So very quickly on the vegan athletes issue, a well-planned vegan diet can support athletic performance. Um, so there's been some studies that is it better, right? And there's nothing to say that it's actually better or worse, but if you have a well-planned vegan diet, you definitely can support it. Women who are uh, vegan and are at that high level, um, athletic level, need to specifically watch out for iron. That can be something that they need to watch out for even more. And this is getting a little technical, but if you're into... Um, athletic performance, one of the things is that vegans can have a lower mean muscle creatine cr concentration, and so there have been some studies that that might be something to um, supplement. So, Okay, well, we don't have any teenagers in here. Anybody? Parents to teenagers? Anybody? No? No? Uh, yeah? You gotta Wait a minute. How, yeah, so we have a few teenagers in here. Excellent. So um, most of the research has been done on vegetarian teens, not vegan teens. There are some studies, especially coming out of Sweden and Norway, on vegetarian teens or on vegan teens. So this is on pl plant-based vegetarian. But again, more likely to consume more fiber, iron, folate, vitamin A, vitamin C than omnivores. 
um, more fruits and vegetables, right? So again, um, something that can be challenging to get a teenager to eat is lots of fruits and vegetables. Well, plant-based tends to do that. Fewer sweets, fewer fast foods, and fewer salty snacks. And then also more likely to be involved in sports activity and less time watching TV. So I think that's nice for our youth, right? So if you know that's, someone. That's too, that's why I keep yeah, yeah. Youth. Yeah. So there's that. So this is kind of in the, the wrapping up stage, and then if there's questions. So I started off talking about how a vegan diet can be very supportive to our bodies in terms of our health. But perhaps we all know we could eat a vegan diet and be very unhealthy, right? We could eat a lot of sugar. We could eat a lot of vegan fast food, right? I mean, and what I mean by fast food is there's a lot of processed foods out there. And it's awesome that they're vegan baked goods. I think they're great. I think they're better than non-vegan baked goods, right? A vegan cookie, a really well-crafted vegan cookie, I love cookies. They're amazing. But we have to watch out for those kind of things, right? So... It's important that it be nutrient dense and whole foods, right? On top of being vegan, if that's the, the route that you want to go. Exactly. So, in terms, yeah, organic, local, seasonal, support your farmer's market, get a CSA. Anybody have a CSA, a box that they get, right? Where you get. Uh, so a community supported agriculture. So, um, for example, every Friday we get a box of vegetables on our front door delivered, organic, local. Um, sometimes we get new things that we hadn't tried before. Like now I'm a fan of fennel. Wow, fennel, fennel roasted. So delicious. You had fennel last night? Yeah, I caramelized it with oh, some onions. Yeah, so good. Fennel's great. And fennel's great raw in salads. Um, great in soups. So as we're getting into soup weather. Well, I had never tried fennel until it arrived on my doorstep in a CSA box, right? So I think it's really nice because it, it um, branches out your, uh, your repertoire of vegetables. It smells great. And it smells great. It's very kind of licorice-y. Like yeah. It. Yeah, with the caramelized onions. I know. Are we hungry? <laughs> So, um, again, we'll start with our fruits and vegetables, right? So, very, very lucky that if you're eating the fruit and the vegetable in its whole form, right, you're eating a whole food. So, um, and I really think, vegan or not, at least half of our diet should be fruits and vegetables, right? Mostly vegetables with some fruits. Um, so, a good kind of rule of thumb is look at your plate. At least half of it should be vegetables. And probably, uh, as a vegan, that's probably not hard, right? And so, we're, we're kind of ahead of the game there. Um, uh, let's see what else. Okay, so our whole grains. How many servings of vegetables do you recommend again? So again, your servings are going to depend on how much you're eating, but um, yeah, so they're, they're saying five to seven five throughout the day, mm -hmm. but if you think about... Some people say 12 to 15. Yeah, so you also have to think about a serving size. So for example, with our whole grains cooked, brown rice, quinoa, all of those whole grains, does anybody know what a serving size is? Half a cup. Half a cup. That's also if you do your whole grain pasta. Half a cup. Your oats cooked. Half a cup. How much is a half a cup? Well, imagine a light bulb. That's half a cup. How many of us, we'll, 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 we won't even say when we're at home, but we go out to a restaurant, it's a vegan restaurant, whatever, it's great. You get pasta. How many of you have a half a cup of pasta on your plate? Easily, right? Two or three cups, which is six servings of your pasta, right? So, for example, when we have pasta, we have organic, whole wheat. We often do um, um, gluten-free pasta. Half a cup. Half a cup of pasta. And you'll put it on your plate, and you'll say, Michelle's crazy. That's ridiculous. My husband makes fun of me, and he'll put four strings of pasta on my plate and say, here's your serving. And I'm like, oh, you're so funny, honey. Um, so, but half a cup. And guess what the other plate is? It's full of beans, vegetables, sauce, right? And it's delicious. A little nutritional yeast on top. Done. Right? And so it's just kind of rethinking, rethinking our portions a little bit. Um, quinoa, everyone knows about quinoa, another great source of protein, um, and it's technically a seed, it's not a grain, but I put it with the grains because we sort of eat it like a grain. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about our protein sources, so again, whole food, and then our healthy fats, so olive oil, coconut oil, macadamia nut oil, if you can get it, is great. Um, my dad and my sister both live in Hawaii, and whenever I go, I like... 
leave room in my suitcase to bring home my macadamia nut oil because it's so good. And avocados. I really eat an avocado at least half every day, every other day. It's so good. So good. And um, it really satisfies. Um, Colleen Patrick Goudreau is going to give her talk, I think, next. Um, she's fantastic if you haven't heard her talk. But I heard her talk at Oakland Veg Week, and she get, made a really great point. You know, sometimes when we're craving something, what we're actually craving is texture or flavor, right? And so an avocado, maybe we're craving something kind of fatty and kind of creamy, right? We don't actually need cheese to satisfy that. Avocado will do that, right? And then we're getting the healthy benefits of the avocado. So, just something to think about. Is avocado and macadamia uh, the essential fatty? Um, they have a, some, but they're not in their higher profile, but they're good quality sources of fat. I've seen avocado yeah. oil. Yeah. You know what? Um, I have to check and see in terms of its profile for cooking. Um, did anybody go to the Eat Real Food Festival yesterday in Oakland? Anybody know? It's great. They had avocado honey. So, it was honey from bees that had been pollinating in avocado trees. And I, it was really cool. It, was, it kind of blew my mind. Um, so why do we want to eat whole foods? Oh, yeah. A couple years ago, all the experts here said, don't have any more olive oil. Did you hear that? Or because so, you rancid or something? Yeah, so with the olive oil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I still drink it. Yeah, so, all, so again, olive oil, lower heat, not your higher heat, okay? They said don't eat oil. Uh, do you know, remember what? I don't know. I think he was saying more for the, the rancid. Mm -hmm. The other thing with olive oil you might have also heard, too, is that um, there was quality issues. They're, they were putting, they were calling it, it was a labeling issue. And, I, and they were calling it extra virgin and actually had, like, canola oil or something in it. Yeah, so you want to get it from a good source. And again, I recommend getting an organic source. It, it, it's on the stability. It's not as unstable as your other oils, but it can it can go. All, all fats could eventually go rancid. Yeah. You can keep it in your refrigerator. It does, it'll get cloudy, but it'll be fine. so hard. Yeah. I was just I've heard that you have to buy it as fresh as possible, so those like big drugs at Costco. Right. Yeah. Like, it's just stand in dark place. So a dark bottle in like dark a bottle. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Anything. I mean, all oil can eventually go rancid, right? So keeping it in a dark, cool place and buying, you know, again, not a jug of it, right? So that you're using it more frequently. So, um, actually, a vegetarian diet has actually been shown to be very beneficial for bone density, which is which is really good news. Um, I've read about this acid alkaline. Oh yeah, because I feel like this is like my um, like final exam. Yeah. So acid alkaline. <laughs> so here's very briefly about acid alkaline. So um, we want to eat more alkaline. Luckily, vegetables are very alkaline, right? Um, most fruits are. There's a few fruits that are more acidic. But um, we want to keep our body in balance with our alkaline. And foods that are acidic, meat is very acidic. Mm -hmm. Dairy is very acidic. Our grains are actually fairly acidic. So uh, it doesn't mean don't eat grains, but it means you want to balance it out with your vegetables. Processed foods, sugar, alcohol, all very acidic. So... Water. Carbonate, carbonation, mm -hmm, caffeine. Does vinegar uh, depends on the vinegar. So, like um, umabashi plum vinegar, lower acidic. Balsamic, pretty high acidic. So, yeah. So it can it can vary. The vinegar's not all um, on one kind of thing. But it doesn't mean don't have it. It means creating balance. So. Um, in the summer, in the, in the, when it's warmer, you want to have more alkaline. You could have you, like 70-30, 70% 70 30, 70 alkaline foods, 30% acidic foods. That would be a nice balance. Uh, in the winter months, sometimes it's, it, you might find that you're doing more 40-60. So for, carbonate, for carbonation, do you mean just regular soda drinks? Even some of the sparkling that? water. There's there's some evidence, yeah, showing that it's not as good for us as the still. Yeah. Now, this is where it's all, like, if someone's going to choose between making their own carbonated water and having a Coke, I'm going to say make your own carbonated water, right? It's a degree of, of scales, right? But, um, yeah. 
Okay, so why do we want to eat whole foods? They are rich in vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and our phytochemicals. Healthier immune system, greater physical and mental energy, a cleaner body composition, and a stronger digestive tract. Oh, that should be tract. And um, I was a former English teacher, so I see, I see these typos and I flinch a little bit. Um, and then many nutrition experts agree, so again, we're kind of taking it, that a diet focused on whole foods not only can prevent diseases, but increase the overall quality of life, more energy, stronger immunity, and greater vitality. Yeah. Also, you're less likely to leave it. Uh, genetically modified foods. Absolutely. Although, yeah, and I'm, and I'm glad you're wearing that. And again, you know, I really support the labeling. So when that comes around again, let's make sure we get our voices out about that. Corn and soy are the number one, right? Those are kind of the two biggest. So always, always make sure you get organic corn and soy products. Um, but yeah, and, and I mean, we've got, to, we've got to be educated and we have to be informed, so yeah. But you know, I mean, who knows what they're going to do to our broccoli, right? So, so we, we've, right? Yeah, exactly. How do you educate and discipline yourself so you get the seven or more vegetables a day? I know I should do it and I don't do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. You should do it. Well, one of the best ways to get all of your, um, all of your vegetables is to blended food. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm doing a demo tomorrow at mm. 30 if anybody Excellent. wants to come and learn. And what's your name? Um, Chef Lisa. Book. Chef Lisa. So blended food. So like... Yeah, so blended foods, because that way you can drink your salad, mm -hmm. because that's a lot of chewing. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of chewing, mm -hmm. and so and it gets more easily absorbed through the mm -hmm. digestive So adding kale to your smoothies. Or you shop, you buy, because they spoil the vegetables. Too. Yeah, so... You go shopping, you, you buy the seven vegetables you can eat that day, or... Eat yeah, that's a good question, right? I mean, no, really, it's, a, it's an important question, that? right? We always yeah. have to balance convenience with with our health right and we have to decide where that line is for us right so is it better to buy your well first of all let's start with where it's best grow your own vegetables right pick it and eat it right I mean really then you know exactly what's going on that vegetable and you're eating it in its freshest state possible I live in a condo I grow herbs that's about all I, I'm growing right now so I put fresh herbs on all my foods but I'm not growing my vegetables so the next thing is getting it local right because it's more likely to have been freshly picked rather than picked in Argentina or Chile and all the food miles that it takes to get it shipped there. And even if it's organic, right, we have to think about our food miles, mm -hmm. all the petroleum that goes to ship that food. Um, so buying seasonally, right, being back in touch with our circadian rhythms, right, and being in touch with, I mean, look what comes in the winter. It's our root vegetables, right? right? Great for soups, great for roasting, right, giving us that kind of energy that we need to conserve our heat for the winter. Summer, right? We get our stone fruits and our peaches and our greens, right? So, you know, it's, it's kind of looking at it from that holistic kind of viewpoint. How, how do you shop, though, to make sure you, you shop every day? Or um, I shop a couple just, times a week. Just, you know, that's yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do a couple times a week. Um, because it's you know it's important to me and I, I make time for it, but I know people are people are busy, right? It's it's hard. So again, it's a degree of scales. Like a five day old broccoli is still going to be better than a Big Mac, right? Right? I mean, really, like we have to cut ourselves a break, right? Like it's it we you know we have lives, and and unless our lives are surrounded completely by our food, which may not be the healthiest, right? Yeah. Your opinion about so we mentioned smoothies and, and smoothies. I make smoothies that are green smoothies mm -hmm. with a lot of fruit. Or and if they sit a couple of days, is that okay? As opposed to juicing, where I think you need the fiber from the smoothies. Yeah, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, or if you're going to address that. I'll, I'll just do real briefly. Yeah. Um, when with blended foods, you it's best if you eat them right away because what happens is an oxidation process. And during the oxidation process, you start to lose some of the essential vitamins and nutrients. But a smoothie is okay for about 24 hours, but it's best right afterward. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. That's my thoughts. Yeah. So, yeah. Then you can a juicer, you know, where a lot of people like you just throw away the A cold pressed juicer. When you use the cold juice, but juicing is juicing is um, 
there's benefits to there's benefits to both, but I can talk yeah. to you after. Yeah, and I also recommend um, doing more vegetables and fruit. Oh, Using the right. fruit to, to sweeten yeah. the like vegetables. An apple in your vegetables. Exactly. Juice. And think I mean carrot really sweetens mm -hmm. a juice a lot. Um, yeah, green apples, great. Green apples actually very cleansing and good for the digestive system. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so adding it to your smoothie and I mean just one more quick thing. Yeah. How do you plan your diet for the week? Do you get everything you want? <laughs> yeah. I gotta plan it. I know. So I does anybody have? Do do? So one of the things <laughs> we do is I actually have a little whiteboard on our refrigerator, and as I'm cooking food, I actually plan it out for the week. It, so I'm an organizer. I mean, sometimes it'll just be a few days ahead, and then I'll be like, okay, we don't have anything for Thursday. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like the plan. Other people are like, hey, it's Tuesday. What are we going to make today? So it's really, it's really up to you, you know, to decide. But, like, we do a lot of soups, especially in the winter. So, you know, and I don't want to eat the same thing for lunch as I eat for dinner. So I'll kind of map out my soup. I also do, um, a, this is another suggestion, do a soup exchange with a friend. Um, you can just do it, like, once a month. But, um, you know, when you make soup, you make a lot of it. It's awesome, but you don't necessarily want to eat it every single day for the next five days. So do a soup exchange so that you're getting a different variety of foods, and um, it's kind of nice, and it's kind of, I don't know. I think it's a good way to do things. Yeah. Dr. Neil Barnard from the, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, he's got a program called Kickstart, 15-day Kickstart program. And, or 21 day kickstart mm -hmm. program and he has all the recipes and menus on his oh, great. website mm -hmm. yeah. lots of ideas great of different mm -hmm. kinds of foods fabulous. and it's all vegan all and vegan. that's fantastic yeah. that's great yeah well, i'd like to share a couple things too yeah i'll just close that i'm a marketing director with use plus but there okay has, yeah there has been 31 published studies on us and we're fruits and vegetables in a capsule so there has been research on fruits and vegetables and it's unbelievable what it does uh, the other thing is, there's a, a company called Farm Eagle. Have you heard about mm -mm, them yet? Mm -mm. Farm Eagle is a group. Go to farmeagle.com, and they're looking for people who might be interested in joining them in New York, New Jersey, and here in the Bay Area. They are going to distribute from local farms delivery to a spot, and you can go and pick it up. So someone has to go in the business. Somebody in San they're looking for people who might be interested in doing this. And, um, and then you can choose what you want to eat, and you can order mm. as often as you want to. You do not have to have a box every week. Yeah. And it's real user, and I've looked at the website. Good. Later. So yeah. it's a new company and something to think about yep. for those who like to have their food delivered. Great. Okay, so I'm going to just wrap it up so we have time for last minute questions. This, again, could be its own topic, um, but I do want to mention it because when you're eating a plant-based diet, you might want to think about sprouting your food. Um, it's sort of, I call it, like advanced nutrition, um, but it might be something you want to explore and look into more. Uh, I know there's a couple vendors out there. I saw uh, two guys, they, they were very friendly and very nice, who had a sprouted nut butters. So, yeah, it was a, a good. I, I didn't want to eat it because I was going to give my talk, but um, <laughs> I'm going to go out and eat afterwards. Um, um, but, but sprouting your nuts, your grains, your beans, and your seeds can be very beneficial. It increases the nutrition profile, especially vitamin C and some of your other minerals. It makes them more biochemically available. Um, it also makes it easier to digest. So if you have issues with digesting beans or nuts or seeds, um, by sprouting them, they, they digest much more easily. It actually also activates the food enzymes, right? So by sprouting it, you're actually, it's starting to grow. And so the food enzyme composition changes, which is also very beneficial to our, our system. So when you soak beans overnight to cook them? It's that not quite work? sprouting them, but that is a better, yeah, you definitely, so there's soaking and then there's sprouting. So um, soaking is a good first step. Soaking your grains, soaking your beans um, is a good kind of start, but the sprouting you, you actually soak and then you let, lay out to dry and they actually start to sprout. They actually start to grow their sprout. Um, I, if you want to try starting it, I, I suggest um, sunflower seeds because they're pretty easy and they're sort of little user friendly and you can see the little sprouts and um, they taste really good. Um, rice is a little bit harder because the sprout's really tiny so you'll be like, is it sprouting? Is it sprouting? Is it sprouting? So I like the, sun, or the sunflower seeds because they're very like, hey, I'm sprouting. Like broccoli. Yeah, broccoli. Mm -hmm, broccoli sprouts. Really stinky. 
sulfur. Oh yeah. Yeah, that sulfur is a good sulfur. Yeah. So our garlic, our broccoli, right? All that that's good sulfur for our bodies. Very toxifying. Yeah. Detoxifying. You know, I read that you have to be careful about buying the sprouted foods in the supermarket because people get sick from that. Yes. That so there, there is some. I mean, there is some concern with spoiling with, with spoiling. So it's always best to make your own. Make your own. Mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. Um, this again is like a whole topic. But does anybody know about phytic acids? So phytic acids are in things like grains and beans and nuts and seeds. And if you're eating a vegan diet, you're eating a lot of that food, right? I mean, I eat that food every single day. So the phytic acid is actually not good because what it does is it binds to our minerals like our zinc and our calcium and our iron and so it doesn't allow for the absorption. So you can be eating, you know, your blackstrap molasses and your greens and all these things and then it's actually not getting absorbed because of the phytic acid, the, the phytates. And so by sprouting, you neutralize that. Soaking does to some degree, sprouting does a lot more. Yeah. Hemochromatosis is a disease where um, you don't have malabsorption of iron and it starts caking on the organs. Mm. Do they know anything about this phytic acid being? That is a good question. I don't know. That's a really, really good question. Yeah. So this is definitely something to think about. There's a lot of great resources online. I don't know if anybody's sprouting at today's or tomorrow's talks. Um, and many of them can be eaten raw, and if you do cook your grains, your sprouted grains, sprouted lentils are great. Um, they require less cooking time, so that's a benefit as well. Okay, so um, these are kind of my wrap-up. Drink plenty of water throughout the day. Be mindful when we're eating, right? Many of us um, are choosing a vegan diet because... We might have some beliefs about the energy of our food, and that's not just our animal food, right? That's also our plant food. Someone grew that food, right? Someone picked that food. Someone transported that food. Someone put that food out on display. And I think it's just really important to be mindful of our food that, that a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of um, sweat went into creating our food, right? That we, we get so beautifully and so bountifully. And so um, really showing gratitude, saying grace, eating slowly. Uh, oh, she's left. But that's actually one of the best things you can do for your digestion is chew your food. Mm. Liquefy your food. And even your blended food. Right. You, still chew it. you still chew your blended food, right? Because you're, you're releasing the um, saliva, the amylase, right? But slowing down, right? Slowing down when we eat. Get enough sleep. I cannot stress this enough, right? For health, you need to sleep. And then eating in balance, right? So we don't have to be perfect. Perfect is completely overrated, right? Um, we are perfect beings right now just as we are. And so I like this idea of the 80-20 rule where if 80% of what we're eating is nourishing our body, then the other 20% our bodies can handle as long as we're not in a diseased state, right? But when that is reversed, right, um, it's not just empty calories, it's depleting calories. So we want to think in terms of nourishment. Thank you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, very quickly in our last minute. Again, I'm a health coach and nutrition consultant. I specialize in plant-based diets. You will go to other nutritionists and they will try to tell you to eat meat. I will not. I will help you find a nourishing way to um, meet the needs of your body. Um, I also wanted, if you know anybody who's pregnant or wanting to be pregnant, I'm doing a creating joy in your pregnancy class. So you can ask me more about that. I'm also starting a healthy eating group in Oakland, so if anybody wants to be a part of that, I can, absolutely. And um, thank you, enjoy, and I'll be over at the speaker table for a little bit if you have questions. Oh, oh, sorry, here we go.